Would you turn with me to uh, Peter, the book of First Peter and the second chapter? Are you going to believe with me this morning on what we should do? I've got some uh, number of things to do. We've got a number of scriptures I think we should take the time to go to and look. And it's just going to take a little time. Anything worth doing is worth doing right. Right? And we've had a couple extra things, so we're a little bit late getting started. So uh, uh, how many let's believe with me and let's just do what we need to do and get the job done, right? Okay. If you have not been with us, then you might not know, but we have been ministering for some weeks now on the subject of the offerings of the Lord. The offerings of the Lord. In the first Peter and the second chapter, first Peter two, five, he said, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Is it true that we have been made priests and kings unto our God? Well, what do priests do? Well, if you go back and study, I mean, uh, you know, what, how, how would you understand priest and the priesthood? You'd have to go back to the Old Testament and read uh, books like Leviticus and see what the priest did, who they were and what they did. And you'll find that a big part of what they did involved the offerings of the Lord. So much of their time and their day and their effort was involved in the offerings. And there were many and numerous and varied. And he said today, We, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. Now, let me just go over this again. What is the house of God? We are. Now, now just us in this local congregation in Branson? No. This building? Is this building the house of God? This local church? Is it the house of God? No, it's a part. Not, not just the building, not the physical facilities. The house of God are all those living stones who've been sealed into place by the Holy Spirit. Right? And the house of God consists of those that have genuinely been born again all over this country, all over this world, and those not only on the earth, but already in heaven. Right? We, all of us together, make up the house of God. It's a spiritual house. And he said, we are, as the priests of the Lord, what are we to do? A holy priesthood. We're to offer up. Everybody say, offer up. Offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, again, when you say spiritual, so many times people's minds go off on a tangent and they think that spiritual things have nothing to do with natural things. But no, spiritual things are manifested in the natural. For instance, are we just natural? We're spirits. But we express ourselves through this natural body. Right? You're sitting there right now looking at me through those two windows we call eyes. You're not just a body. You're inside that body, right? But just because you're a spirit, does that mean that that you have nothing to do with the natural? No. Your spirit expresses itself in the natural. And we've already talked about this, but do you understand that any offering? Let's say an offering of praise, an offering of thanksgiving, an offering of worship could be spiritual and acceptable to God, or it could be just fleshly and unacceptable to God. Right? You could just make a bunch of noise, but you're thinking about fried chicken, and you don't care, and your heart's not in it. Right? 
Wouldn't make any difference how many notes you hit or how perfectly you did it musically. That doesn't matter. God looks at the heart and it's not spiritual and it's not acceptable to God. With all of our money offerings and all of our stuff, they could be either just carnal and natural and unacceptable to God or they can be spiritual sacrifices and offerings acceptable to God. Now technically an offering, what is an offering? Offering, something that is offered. And what sometimes I think we haven't camped on enough, just because something is offered, that does not mean it is automatically accepted. Right? And we've already seen numerous places that, that prove conclusively God does not accept all offerings. Just because something is brought to Him or offered to Him, that does not mean He has to receive it or accept it. There are some offerings that are acceptable to Him and some that are unacceptable. There are those He receives, there are those He does not receive. Now we already have a big clue in the New Testament, without faith, it is impossible to please Him, so the offerings must come in faith. How would you know that you brought it in faith? One big indication, you're right, one big indication is you do it with joy. See, if you put something in the plate and you watch it all the way down the road, <laughs> and you think, man, I could have used that. Are you glad about putting it in there? Then did you put it in there in faith? No, you didn't. Well, then is it acceptable to God? No. Did he receive it? No. And that explains why a lot of people do things mechanically, even tithe mechanically or put in offerings mechanically. They do it like you're paying the electric bill or their taxes or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? You know, don't wish we didn't have to, but you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. God's not going to make us do anything. He doesn't just want you to do something. He wants you to, des to desire to do it. Right? To do it gladly, to do it willingly, to do it freely, that and only that way is how it's acceptable to Him. And we ministers and pastors and teachers and preachers and heads of uh, ministries and heads of homes ought to re represent Him properly. You know, if somebody, you know, tells me, it's happened before, I've been in the ministry for a number of years before, and if I detect that somebody does not want to do what they're doing in the service of God. Well, okay. If I have to. <laughs> mm -mm. That's not okay. Don't care how much we think we need you. Did you hear me? It, it's not acceptable to God that way. Oh, if you'll just shut up, I'll put the money in. I'll put the money in if you'll be quiet. No, we're not going to be quiet, and we don't want your money. Amen. No. <laughs> this ain't about money. It's about heart. Yeah. Right? right? It's very important. So no, I, and, and you know, you got flesh, and I got flesh, but I don't care how your flesh feels when it comes time to do the things of the Lord, you make your flesh get in line. If you don't feel like doing it gladly, you get yourself by the ear and you twist it real good and you go, hey, <laughs> you smile. <laughs> this is a privilege, right? Whether you feel like it or whether you don't, it's a privilege. And if you'll take a step of faith by it like that, it won't be long, you'll feel like it's a privilege. And if you walk in this daily, you, you won't have so much trouble with that. I count it a privilege. You know, I get to preach and teach a lot. Now, thank God for it. But I don't get tired of it. It's a privilege. Every time. We get to give offerings all the time ourselves. I don't get tired of it. It's a privilege every time. It's a privilege every time to open this book and read these words. Every time to pray in Jesus' name. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's a blessing. Can you say amen? amen. Would you go to Proverbs, the third chapter? Now, we looked at this last week. And I believe the Lord helped us get the spirit of some things. 
If you weren't here, it would have helped you to heard that before you heard this. Tapes and CDs are available. You may need to catch up with us. You know, a lot of times people try to, uh, you know, they, they, drop, they drop in or tune in a broadcast and hear two sentences and then turn it off. They didn't hear the hours and hours that went before it. They didn't hear the hours and hours that came after it. And so they want to take that sentence and twist it and make it say something that was not said at all. This happens all the time. Uh, you know, it happened with Jesus, didn't it? They twisted his words. He said, he talked about, you know, uh, if this body is killed, he said, it'll be, this temple is, is torn down, it'll be raised again in three days. They said, he said, he's going to take this temple that it took 40 years to build, and, and he's going to tear it down, and he's going to be, he never said any of that. But I mean, that's part, that's part of what they judged him for, right? That's part of what they tried to find justification to execute him over. Well, people whose hearts are wrong, they're going to twist stuff and make it say what they want it to say, no matter what you say. Right? So no need in getting upset, preachers, no need getting upset, running around, trying to straighten out everybody that misquoted you. <laughs> it's, you'll just be frustrated and tired. <laughs> I've had, uh, I, I had a fellow come one time and he said, you know, uh, well, you know, you said such and such when you was preaching the other day. I said, I don't think so. He said, well, yeah, you did. I was right there. I heard it. I said, well, I don't think so because that's not what I believe. I believe the opposite of that. He said, oh, no, no, you said it. You said such and such. How many understand that? That's pretty strong. How many understand that's very disrespectful, yes. right? Yeah. And that lets you know a lot about the person right off the bat. But anyway, I said, I don't think so. I said, I said, we got tapes, don't we? I said, find it. Come back and tell me. Well, the next day or so, he, I saw him. He said, uh, I said, you, did you get the tape? Was it on there? He said, yeah. I said, well, what did I say? He said, well, that ain't exactly what you said. He said, but that's what you meant. Oh. <laughs> ah. Some folk have deep revelation. They, they know more what you mean than you do yourself. <laughs> Bless some folks' hearts. Proverbs 3, are you there? Man, I got a ways to go this morning. Are you with me? Can you hook with me? See, now the more, the more focused you are, the quicker we can move. If I sense that most folk are not getting it, I won't just rush through it. We'll have to stop and go over it again or say it a different way. But the quicker you get it, we just, we just keep moving right along. Proverbs 3, verse 9. What does it say? Honor, Honor the Lord. He's not talking about with your words. With what? Yes. With your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. Uh, another translation said, Honor the Lord with your capital, that's the amplified, and sufficiency, and with the first fruits of all your income. The NIV says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, and with the first fruits of all your crops. How many know you'd have to have some wealth? In order to honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your substance. Now we, we went back and looked at places where it talked about Job's substance. Was all that huge amount of stock and resources that he had. And again and again substance literally meant stuff. Honor the Lord with your stuff. Your, your resources. Your material ability. Can you do that? Can you honor God with stuff? And he said, what else? Honor the Lord with your substance and with what? First the first fruits of all your increase or your income. What would happen if you do that? Your barns will be filled 
with plenty, one translation said they'll overflow, and your presses will burst out with new stuff, new wine. How many like the, the full and overflowing and busting out and new stuff? You like, you like that? Is that the Word of God? Is that the will of God? What comes first? Honor. So we, we camped last week on that part, honoring the Lord. How you honor Him with offerings. Honor the Lord with what? Substance. Your stuff. And with what? The first fruits of all your increase. I want to talk about first fruits this morning. First fruits. Now, there's been <laughs> a lot of ignorance on this subject, and then there's been some confusion on this subject. And I don't purport to tell you I know all about it any more than I know all about tithing or all about any portion of the Word of God. We can only walk in the light we have, right? And if you came to me and you said, well, Brother Keith, you know, I don't, I don't believe what you taught on tithing uh, the other day. I don't believe what you taught own offerings, you know, and I don't agree with all that. Well, uh, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fuss. Have no desire to. And if you're walking in all the light that you have and you're sincere before God, I respect that. Just see to it that it's not about the money. Did you hear that part now? See to it that it is not of you, what you're trying to say you believe See to it that it's not about the money, but walk in the light that you have. Now, another thing that's important to understand, we've got Old Testament and we've got New Testament, right? Same God, true? And He never changes. God has not changed. God, God's not a different God in the New Testament than He was in the Old Testament. He'd have had to have changed. He does not change. He never changes. He never will change. He doesn't need to change. <laughs> He's perfect, just like He is. <laughs> Unlike us. <laughs> and we're, we're changing into His image from glory to glory, which is perfection. Being perfected towards perfection, which is Him. But the Old Testament is not to be ignored. It is not to just be set aside. If it has nothing to do with us, then we don't need a complete Bible. All we need is a New Testament. Right? But no, the Old Testament is the Word of God. Right? And the New Testament is the Word of God. I mean, thou shalt not steal is still a right word. Thou shalt not kill. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. So many things. I mean, unless it is modified and changed by the New Testament, it stands. As it is written, the Word of God lasts forever, cannot pass away, cannot fail. Now, one big difference is that we... Uh, in the Old Testament, they lived by the doing of the law. By keeping of the law, they endeavored to be righteous. In the New Testament, not so. We live by faith. And we're led by the Spirit. Is that right? And sometimes you'll hear people say, well, now, I don't, I don't believe in all that tithing and, and that first fruits. And I don't believe in all that. I just believe in being led. I couldn't agree more about the being led part. I believe in being led by the Spirit of God in your giving every day, all the time. But you, if you tell me that I, you know, the Spirit of God has led me the last 20 years to put 1% of my income into the kingdom of God, I don't believe you're being led. Right? When under the old covenant, they put 10% plus offerings. And you're telling me that under a new and a better covenant, the Spirit of God leads us to do less than the old covenant? No. 
So if you're a giver, if you're putting something of your income into the kingdom of God, you're putting some percentage. Right? And people that I know that are sold out to God, they didn't stop at 10%. Did you hear me? I know Phyllis and I certainly had, hadn't. We've been increasing all the time. We, we bumped ours up another 5% this year. Glory. Glory to God. And it was way over 10 to start with. I'd like to get to 51. What do you mean? Well, if God getting 51 is controlling interest in any operation. Is that right? 51%. I know more than one situation where people have gone from putting 10% of their income and living on 90 till over a period of years, it completely reversed, and they were putting 90% of their income into the kingdom of God and living like a king on the remaining 10%. How many know you can live good on 10% of 10 million a year? You can live good on that. If enough's coming in, 10%'s good. But now, if, if you don't have a desire for that, and you're not interested in that, well, that's your business. We're not, we're not here to try to make anybody do anything. But I got some hungry folks in this church. I know that. And, and, and you, you want to know everything you can know and do everything you can do. And so we must not withhold anything that we can see to help. Would you uh, go with me to the book of... Uh, Genesis, the fourth chapter. Somebody said, we're going from Genesis to Revelation? We sort of, yeah. <laughs> Genesis, the fourth chapter. Now, this is the first thing we looked at when we began our study on the offerings of the Lord, isn't it? It's the first offerings that are described. And the Bible said in Genesis 4, 3, in the process of time it came to pass, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground a what? Offering. offering to the Lord. Now we know from reading the rest of the story, his offering was unacceptable, right? God didn't receive his offering, and there were substantial reasons why. He didn't just make a technical mistake. He wasn't doing the best he knew how and just came short. No, his heart wasn't right. I mean, that's obvious. My, you know, word, not long after this, he murders his brother over an offering. Now, you know, I, I wondered about this for years because I have caught more flack and got more nasty grams. You might know what I mean by that? Ugly letters about teaching on, on, on these subjects than anything else. Teaching about giving and teaching about, you know, more than one time it's got back to me. Somebody came to visit and, and they said, I just don't like hearing about that money stuff. And so they didn't want to come back. Well, I can't help that. Because I didn't write this. Did you hear me? But what, what is it that bothers people so bad about this? Why would a man kill, murder his own brother? Over an offering. Why do people get so bent out of shape over this? It's a bigger deal than people have thought for. It's a matter of the heart. And people say, well, don't talk about money. I just, I don't, don't, why? 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 Well, it's not important. Yeah, I know. You only spend most of the prime of your life trying to make some. It's not important. You're here for a couple of hours, but what do you do the rest of the week? Huh? Why? If you had 50 million sitting in the bank, would you do the same thing? That's a question, isn't it? Would you do exactly the same thing? No, money affects your life. And the Bible even talked about that, you know, the love of money is the root of all kinds and manner of evil. It's a big deal. And Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. So people's solution is to not talk about it. No, he talked about it. In fact, if you go back, go through and underline and mark everywhere money's talked about, you will get a revelation. 
Oh, it's, it goes on and on and on and on. Well, in talking about this, in Genesis 4, Cain brought an offering. Verse 4, Abel, he also brought of what? The firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering. Now, the, the word used to describe Abel's offering right off the bat is what? Firstling of what is a first fruit. Fruit is something that's produced. What is first? Not second, right? Not third. Let me say it like this Fluffy was a first fruit, not a tithe. Did you hear me? If the Lord had wanted to say it was a tithe, he'd have said it. And if you're like me, for years, for years, I thought first fruits and tithes were the same thing. For years. And he even preached it like that a time or two. But you know, you only have the light you have. And one day some things began to bug me about it. As I was reading it again, I thought, well, now hold on, that don't work. And as I began to examine it, I thought, well, no, it can't be the same thing. And as we go on today, you'll see. But I want you to see that the first offering that was mentioned was not a tithe. It was a what? It was a first fruit. First fruit. Fluffy is the name for the sheep that we have given around here. Abel's best offering. Fluffy was one of Abel's first lambs. And it was one of the finest ones, I guess the finest one that he had. But it wasn't just one of the finest ones, it was what? It was one of the first ones he had. First and best. Now as we go through, you're going to see the first one is special. We know that, right? Right? The first one is special. Now go back, uh, you're here in, in Genesis. Go over to Exodus, the 13th chapter. <laughs> Y'all are quiet this morning. <laughs> Thinking, huh? Exodus 13. Well, you know it. I've said it many, many times. Don't take my word for anything. Just because I said it is not good enough reason for you to accept it and build your life on it. Hmm? Find it in the Bible. See if you see it for yourself. Exodus 13, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, sanctify to me. Now, what does that mean? The Lord told us that, uh, that about this facility as soon as we got in it. He said, sanctify uh, this place to me. And we understood that means set this place aside for my exclusive use and purposes. And so we don't let just anything go on in here. Right? We've had a lot of people that want to use it for a lot of different reasons and, and things, but unless the Lord tells us that He wants that to happen, we, we must not do it. Right? It's His place. We, we, so we don't use it. We don't have, uh, uh, I don't know, dog shows <laughs> in the auditorium. <laughs> right? We don't have auctions in, in the auditorium. Right? We get ready to eat. We go outside. Right? I mean, we, we treat it with the respect that the Lord talked about. Now, he said, sanctify to me what? All the firstborn whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. It's mine. The firstborn... He said, of man and beast is whose? 
Isn't that what the Lord said about the tithe? He said the tithe is his, the tenth one. Skip down to verse 12. Well, verse 11. He said, It shall be when the Lord shall bring you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that opens the matrix. Every firstling that comes of a beast, which you have, the males shall be the Lord's, and every firstling of an ass you'll redeem with a lamb, and if you'll not redeem it, you'll break its neck, and all the firstborn of man among the children shall you redeem. Verse 15. It came to, well, verse 14, excuse me. It'll be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? In other words, why are you doing this? Why do you give the Lord the first fruit? You'll say to him, by the strength of the hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage, and it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the what? Firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. Now he said all the firstborn, all that open the matrix. Now take a cow for instance. The first calf belonged to the Lord. That's the first calf that had come through that cow. Now if this is a healthy cow, there should be more calves, right? For years. But, but the Lord said, the first one is mine. Did you hear that? It's interesting to know, you know, you find reference to tithing about 32 times in the Bible. You know how many times you find reference to first fruits? 32. <laughs> the same. Yet, how much have you heard about tithes and how much have you heard about first fruits? You don't hear much about it, right? And one reason is because people have mixed them together, that they're the same. Now, we, we've already talked about this in Leviticus. You know, he said the tithe, the tenth, which means tenth, the tenth one is the Lord's. And he talked about that they would count sheep with the rod. We may look at it if we have time, but in, in Leviticus 26, I believe it is. And they, as the sheep would come through, they'd go one, two, three, four, five, six. The sheep are coming through the gate, and they're tapping them with the rod and counting them. Eight, nine. The Lord's. Whether it was good or bad, the passage said. So the tenth was not just the best one. The tenth was the tenth one. Right? Well, the first fruit is not the tenth. It's the what? It's the first one. But now, now get this. The first of all that opens the matrix this is a new channel. A new channel. Didn't say that, that you know you, the first calf of every year goes to the Lord. Just the first calf from that cow. No matter how many she had after that, the first one. Why? Because the first one acknowledges a new channel of income. And that this is from the Lord. There's some folk getting this already, aren't there? Everything that opens the matrix. What does that mean? That there is a new breakthrough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, let me back up a little bit. In talking about these things, uh, people go, well, look, Brother Keith, that's Old Testament. So are most of the references for tithing. But there's some strong references for first fruits in the New Testament. We're going to get to before this is over, I hope. Not, we'll do it, you know, add, a, add another Sunday or something to it. But we don't live 
by law. We don't just do things in this new covenant by rule and by rote. We should be led by the Spirit. But who said these things here? Wasn't it the Spirit who we talk about we're being led by today? Well, how's he going to lead us? Is he going to lead us in a completely different way than anything he said in the past? He never changes. So he's going to lead us in the same paths. And there's only two sources for what people practice and believe. You know what they are? Men's ideas and God's word. Now, God's Word sets precedent. Precedent means that which has gone before. And if it was right to honor God with the tenth then, somebody said, well, that's just a type. Fine. What's it a type of? How do you fulfill that type in the New Covenant? Well, first fruits was in the Old Testament. Absolutely, it's in the New too. New also, we're going to see. But uh, it was just a type. Fine, a type of what? How do you fulfill it in the New? Do you hear what I'm saying? Don't get legalistic about tithing. Don't get legalistic about first fruits. Don't get legalistic about any of the offerings of the Lord. We've already talked about this before. Everything in the new covenant is summed up in walk in love, walk in faith, be led by the Spirit. Everything. Everything. Don't get away from that ever. Well, how, how do I do this? And how, how do I have to do that? And, and tell me how much and, and, and where and when and how? I don't know. You have to tell me. No, no. See, that's where people get off. The answer to a million and one questions is be led. led. You see, people don't like that. Well, just tell me. I'll just write the check. No, (laughs) it's not okay. It's not okay with your tithing to just mechanically figure it to the penny and write the check and do the same thing the same way every time. It's not okay. It's what people want to do you got millions. They want somebody else to tell me what to do. Oh, but we live in a new covenant. Where they'll not ever say every man to his neighbor, know the Lord. For they'll all know me. From the least to the greatest. And we can be led by the Spirit. But the Spirit of God who lives in us said these words. Right? And He's going to lead you in line with these precedents. Isn't He? He's going to lead you in line with everything that God has said. So what is the precedent of first fruits? This they practiced. Why? What does it mean? Everything that opens the matrix. Now go with me to the 23rd chapter of Exodus. 23. I just want to read some, chapter, read some scriptures for a bit here. 23, 16. He said the feast of harvest. 23, 16. The first fruits of your labors, which you've sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is the, uh, in the uh, end of the year, when you've gathered in your labors out of the field. Three times in the year, all your males appear before the Lord God. The Lord commanded them to have three great Uh, celebrations every year, two of them were around the harvest. The first one was when the crops first began to come in. When they first started in and you first begin to get some fruit off of your field, you, you had a celebration and you brought the first fruits to the Lord. And then when you finished gathering everything in, you had another big party. (laughs) When you finished gathering everything. He said in verse 19, The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not see the kid in his mother's milk. I know that sounds strange to us. 
But there's something wrong about taking the baby goat and cooking it in the milk that was meant for the baby goat. And there's something wrong about eating the first one. Are you with me? And he said, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to where? So where do the first fruits go? We see one answer to that question right here. Again, precedent. Don't make anything legalistic. To the house of the Lord. Now again, what is the house of the Lord? Now I know some people, you know, they try to make it so, but I, I can't preach one Sunday that this local church is not the house of God, but that we universally are the house of God. But then another Sunday, come back and when I'm talking about tithing, say, no, this is the house of God. That doesn't work for me. You understand what I'm saying now? The house of God is the same every week. <laughs> We're having fun, aren't we? Glory to God. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. Skip on down further. You're there in 23. Go to 34. 34. Now, this is your first time to be with us this morning. This is a different service than we normally have. It's a little bit different. Exodus 34, 19. All that opens the matrix is mine. Who said that? The Lord. All that opens the matrix is mine. Here is an opening from a new channel. Somebody said, uh, uh, it would be all right to say new sources. No, I don't like to say new sources. We have one source. One source. Many channels. Many channels. I, I know we, we use that word a lot. Well, it come, came from an unexpected source. No, I have one source. And he's expected. Amen. Yeah. Right? It might have been a surprising channel. God uses people and channels that you never thought about. That's one of the great things about him. Uh, he'll surprise you again and again and again. That's great. He gets the glory. So many times when you're believing for something and it comes through, so many times you'll go, wow. Now, I never would have thought it would have come like that. And God does it on purpose. He gets the glory. So again and again, you cannot, you, you cannot stand up and say, ah, I knew it. Yep, I knew just that. No, you didn't. You knew it was coming by faith, but you didn't know how most of the time. You're walking by faith. But God, now, you know, the Lord spoke to us uh, prophetically earlier this year about bringing us up into new places in finances. You remember that? And about basically what we're looking at here, new channels, right? Different, completely different jobs, completely different occupations, new channels. Well, that's what this is talking about. When you get, it's a brand new business. It's, it's a brand new uh, resource, Brand new operation that you've had, and you begin to get regular income through that channel that could go on for the rest of your life. The first one that comes through there is special. Right? The first one that comes, the first paycheck you get on that new job. Did you hear me? Would you have that job if it were not for God? You see. Okay, man, we got the, here, we started a new business, and man, everybody showed up the first day, and whoo, it's off to a good start. 
You see people frame those first dollars and hang them on the wall. Why? Special. But they ought not be on the wall. It's spiritual ignorance that they hang on the wall for years. Because the Lord said, the first one's mine. Yeah, we're making progress now. <laughs> the first one's mine. Is this tithing? It's not tithing. It's not tithing. It's not something that would necessarily happen every week or every month. Did you hear me? But when you sow your seed and you believe God and he gives you an idea and you step out and it's a brand new channel. You never got any money through this channel before, but now here it comes and you could tell it's like a new oil well. <laughs> well, how much could it produce? I don't know, but the first barrel is the Lord's, right? What, what, is, what is that doing? You're acknowledging this didn't just happen. God has brought a brand new channel. Whoo, glory to God, of, of increase. And who knows how many calves this cow can have over the next many years. But I'm going to honor God, and the first one is His. Glory to God. Where does it go? We've already seen one thing. It goes to His house. His house. Who glory to God. <laughs> Where were we? 3419? Go back to 22. Exodus 22. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Exodus 22. And verse 29. Well, let me, uh, th th this whole chapter here, I wish we had time and it was right to teach you on the whole thing. Because what you see, in, in another place, it, it talked about that, that God had given to his people statutes that were so righteous that no other nation that were heathens and worshipped idols could even compare to. They try to make their laws and write their laws, but when God says, do this, it's because it's right. It's not just right on a surface level. It's right from the beginning to the end. It's right forever. It's right in every set of circumstances. And listen to how this whole chapter, how it's flowing. He talks about if somebody steals something, what should be done to make restitution? Verse 5, if a man calls a field or vineyard to be eaten and puts his beast and feeds in another man's field of the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution? Let's just stop right there. If you put your cows in another man's field and he eats up his stuff, what should happen? Repayment. There should be repayment, right? Of the best, it's just right. Is this still right today? See, see, people try to get confused. This is Exodus. This is Old Testament. But it is the unchanging truth of God. Yeah. It's right. Verse 5. What if you set a fire and it breaks out and it catches in thorns and it burns somebody's stacks of corn or a standing corn of the field? What's the right thing? Then he that started the fire should pay for it. That's just right. How many realize we need to read our Old Testament? Hmm? Why? Some say, well, I just believe in being led by the Spirit. Absolutely. But who do you think said this? And how's he going to lead you in daily life? According to these precedents and precepts. Now, I won't go through all of it. It, it, it would take a lot of time. But uh, verse 14, let's just touch on a couple more. If a man borrows something of his neighbor and it be hurt and die, if the owner is not with it, what should happen? Whoever borrowed it pays for it. 
But if the owner is there with it, he doesn't pay for it. It was a hired thing. It came for his hire. See, this is just right. If the owner was there with it, and you're like you're renting it, and the owner's there operating it, and, and the ox, and the ox dies, well, you don't pay for it if the owner was there. Because he was running it, you were paying for the use of it. But if you just had borrowed it, and the owner's not there, and while you're using it, you broke it, will you buy him a new one? This is just right. Can you see all this? Now skip on down. Verse 25. If you lend money to any of my people that is poor by you, and God's taken us from borrowing to lending. That we can loan people money. Right? Then you shall not be to him as a usurer, neither shall you lay upon him usury, that's interest. Don't charge each other interest. He said you could charge the heathen interest, but not each other. If you at all take your neighbor's raiment to pledge, you shall deliver it to him by the sun going down. For that's his covering only in his raiment for his skin. Where shall he sleep? Let's say a man's furniture was part of his collateral for his loan, and he defaulted on his loan. You don't go take the bed out from under the man. The only thing he's got to sleep on. Yeah, he defaulted. He owes it to I don't care. Have some compassion. Right? And he also, you know, it talks about another place. It says if somebody owes you something, you don't go in their house to take it. You stand, you stand outside in the yard, and you let them bring it to you. See, this is just right, isn't it? It, it affords people some dignity. And some, even in the, some of the most uncomfortable times of their life, they're still afforded some respect and some dignity. And in the midst of all this, verse 29, you shall not delay to offer what? The first of your ripe fruits and of your liquors and the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Likewise, you shall do with your ox and your sheep. Seven days it will be with his dam, and on the eighth day you'll give it to me. He said you won't delay to do it. Now turn over to another place. Y'all got time for this? Leviticus 23. If I could do it faster, I would, but I'm, it's the best I know. Leviticus 23. Nine. Leviticus 23, nine says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you be come into the land which I give to you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof. Now let's just stop right here. God's told them about Canaan's land, right? It's a land that flows with milk and honey. He said, it's yours. He said, when you get in there and you plant your seed and I rain on it and the sun shines on it and I give you a great big crop, when it comes in, you're supposed to do something. Well, shouldn't you? Would you even be there in the land if it wasn't for God? Would you have it? Would you, would you have had seed to sow? Would you have a, how many understand if God doesn't protect your crop, if he don't rain on your crop, if the sun don't shine on your crop, there's not going to be any harvest. And so, when you reap the harvest thereof, so this doesn't happen until you are reaping. This doesn't happen until you are reaping. If you're not getting any increase, if you're not breaking into new areas, then this, you don't do this. But you're harvesting. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow. <clears throat> After the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Verse 14, 
And you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you've brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You start to reap. What do you do? This is all about acknowledging God. For, for, you know, people have practiced this and didn't call it this. You think about it. Let's say you come to a place and you're a stranger. And here is a man who's a wealthy landowner. And you are out there living on the side of the road. And he finds you and he says, hey, I got lots of land. How about I give you some seed to sow and you plant that 200 acres down there and, and, and help me with it. And uh, I'll just let you have the harvest. Land needs to be worked. So he, he lets you work the land. It's his land. He gives you the seed to sow. Let's say you plant 200 acres of tomatoes. <laughs> It'd be salsa time, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, when the first ripe tomatoes start coming off the vine, if you're any kind of a person of integrity, what should you think? Take this man, a first, as we say in the South, mess. Anybody know what a mess is? A mess, first mess of fruits and vegetables, mess of meat, you know. Take, take him the first mess of these first ripe tomatoes. Why? Because if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have any tomatoes. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have any land to plant tomato seed. He gave you the seed, Right? I mean, it's just, it's just right. That's right. It's just right to do that. You know, I, I, I assure you, I know it's so, so where I grew up in Mississippi. I know it's so in Arkansas. I know it's so here in Missouri, especially years ago. My granddad used to do it. My folks used to do it when the gardens would begin to come in. Hmm? People would take, or somebody slaughtered a beef, or slaughtered a, 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 a pig, or, or anything, you know. They, again, again, you know, my, my granddad's stuff would start coming in. He'd take the, a first mess of stuff to the pastor. He'd take a first mess of stuff to uh, uh, people in the church. Usually to the pastors and the ministers. What is that? That's a first fruit. People have been practicing it for centuries. Just not calling it that. Why would they do it? Because like the Bible says, even people who don't know the law, when they know God, they do the essence of it. They got the spirit of it in their heart. Why? Because the Holy Ghost who's in you wrote this. He wrote this. Oh, glory to God. We're making progress now. You know, you can just feel it for people go, I don't know about this. <laughs> well, find out. Amen. Don't take my word for it. Yeah. Get in the book. Right? And again, we should do nothing legalistically. Right? It's the spirit of it. Well, how would I know, Brother Keith, what's the first fruit? That's the whole thing about it. You should know in your heart. You'll be going along in life, and if you're sowing and believing God, something will come up, and you'll just know it. This is the first fruit. This is the first, first one out of this. You know, Phyllis and I, when we first came here, and the church started so wonderfully, the Lord led us, if you remember, to sow our first year of ministry into the church. So we didn't get any pay from the church. We sowed that. A year's salary. You ever done that? No. <laughs> Sometimes people want to, you know, they want to find fault. Well, Brother Keith has some nice stuff. I do. Amen. But don't judge my harvest if you don't know nothing about my sowing. Right. Or my seed. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, I got some nice stuff. Going to have a lot nicer yet. So if it bothers you, you're going to really get bothered. <laughs> and I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to hide it. The only reason we should hide it if we're ashamed of it. 
if we did something wrong to get it. It's not what you have. It's how you got it. How it came. And if the Lord added it to you, something to be celebrated. Something to rejoice. Something to uh, let Him get the glory out of. And so we sowed that first year. She and I sowed all of our services without any payment. Glad to do it. Sowed the seed. Well, then that, the, that next year, you're, you're bored and, and you guys decided we want to sow uh, something to y'all. And y'all took us up that uh, one-time offering in the spring of the year. And everybody came down to the front, you know, and brought us money. And it was thousands of dollars. But that was the first offering we had ever gotten in this church. And we knew that. So you know what we did? We sent half of it to Kenneth and Aretha Hagen. And we sent half of it to Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. Because they had personally, we sent it to them personally, because they had been such a, a part of our lives. It was money that came to us personally. Right? And we, we've done that time and time again. With, with the church, the first offerings that came in the church, they went to nothing in this church. They went to other churches and ministries. The first ones. First one. And even without teaching on it, we've had people in this congregation, business people, already, that have started a new branch or started a new business or, and, and their first business day's uh, receipts they brought in. And I see that they've gone quite well too. <laughs> now, go over to, to Romans if you would. How many know Romans is in the New Testament? <laughs> Romans, the 16th chapter. Excuse me, 11th chapter. It's the 16th verse I'm wanting to get to. Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 16. He said, if the, the what? The first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Would you say this is a spiritual principle? Law, you could say. Let me read this to you from other uh, translations. He said, if, part, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. Uh, another translation said, if the first loaf is consecrated, the whole batch is consecrated with it. The Amplified says, if the first handful of dough offered as the first fruits is consecrated holy, so is the whole mass. Now see, the, the writer of the New Testament assumes you are familiar with the old. Right? assumes you know what he's talking about when he said first fruit. And I didn't show you half of the references in the Old Testament to first fruits. Just, just a sprinkling. But here's the principle. Why would the Lord say the first one is mine? Exactly. When you give him that first one, you make him a partner in everything that will ever come from that channel. Oh, glory to God. Woo! Can you see that? And what did he say? If the first one is blessed, then all the rest is blessed. Woo! I'm ready to just shout right now. Glory, glory to God. Go to Ezekiel. Hold your place there. Man, I could use another hour this morning. 
Ezekiel 44. Ezekiel 44. You see this principle. I see I'm not going to be able to get to uh, <laughs> a lot of this today. Most of the New Testament part, I, I need to not rush it and take proper time with it. So unless the Lord says something else, maybe next Sunday. We'll just take our time and camp on it, spend a lot of time in the New Testament. But do you see this one principle already? Can you see people have been practicing it for centuries? Just not calling it that. Right? And here he said, if the first one is holy, then the rest of what it came from is holy. And you'll see that principle described very, very uh, detailed in Ezekiel 44, verse 30. Ezekiel 44, 30. And the first of all the first fruits of all things. That covers a lot of ground now, doesn't it? Read that out loud with me. The first of all the first fruits of all things. He goes on to say, and every oblation of all, every sort of your oblations shall be the priest's. You shall also give to the priest the first of your dough. Well, that fits good today, society, doesn't it? First of your dough. Why? 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 That he may cause the blessing to rest in your house. My, my, my. Why? Because the principle, if the first one is blessed, the rest of what it came from is blessed. Right? It's a spiritual principle. It's always been that way. And see, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, were not ignorant Cro-Magnon or any other kind of prehistoric man. They were beautiful, brilliant. Man has not evolved. Man has devolved. Oh, they were brilliant. And without having a Bible and without having a New Testament, they knew so many of these principles. Why are they bringing an offering to begin with? They didn't have a Bible. They just knew that's what you did. And Abel knew, (laughs) Abel knew, bring God the first one. Bring him the first and the best. Why? He wanted to please God. He loved God. But he also knew it had caused the blessing of God to come on the whole rest of his flock. Oh, my, 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 my. If the first is blessed, the rest is blessed. He said, bring the first, that he may cause the blessing to rest in your house. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Well, if, if you just, you know, don't take my word for it. Like I said, please don't. Get in your Bible and study this and look up everywhere it says first. Look up everywhere it says first fruit or first fruits or the first of. You'll begin to get an eye open. You'll begin to get a revelation. Let me give you one more in closing. Oh, this is good. I, I shouldn't rush through it. Second Kings, turn to it. I think I'm closing. Second Kings. Said out loud, if the first is blessed, the rest is blessed. If the first is holy, the remainder is holy. Second Kings, uh, set, let's see, seven, uh, two different ones I got going at the same time here. First 
Kings 17. It's what I want you to see right now, please. 1 Kings 17. Now, I know you don't have all your questions answered yet. But it's not getting everything in your head, it's getting the spirit of a thing. Yes. That's the main thing. And unless the Lord says something otherwise, we may use the whole time next week to just camp on this and, and go further. Because there's a whole lot more here, as you well see and know. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. The word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, saying, Arise, Get you to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. Well, you think you'd have picked a rich one, you know. <laughs> but he didn't. Why? Because he shows up good in the foolish things and the weak things. Is that right? Did you know God could tell you to do some big things? And you don't have any money right now, and you don't know how it could ever happen right now, but God could use you to sustain some big things if you'd just believe Him. If you'd just say, yeah, here I am, Lord. You can do anything through me. Use me. Widow woman. We know from the rest of the story, she was about as broke as broke could be. He arose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. He called to her. He said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now see, that might sound like a preacher asking for a favor. But it wasn't. It was an opportunity. Did you hear? For her to respond, she's in a desperate situation. And God has sent her the answer to her prayer. But before there's going to be some reaping, there's got to be some, some sowing. It's just God's way, always has been, always will be. So he is actually favoring her and blessing her by asking her for a drink of water. He could ask somebody else. He could have got it himself. But it's an opportunity for her. I mean, somebody said, well, that's nothing. Oh, Really? Jesus said, you give just a cup of cold water to one of these in my name, there's no way you'll lose that reward. It's big to him. And uh, verse 11, as she was going to fetch it. Now that tells you why God used her. Hmm? She could have said, I don't know who you are. All these preachers. I'll tell you what. She could have had an attitude. She could have done all kinds of things. But she just said, sure. Yeah, just, just sit down and rest yourself. I'll go get you some. And he called to her as she's going away. He said, you know, uh, how about bringing me a little bite to eat? <laughs> now that is like asking for gold and platinum. Because there is a famine going on and food is so precious people are starving to death in the streets. And this preacher says, hey, you know, won't you bring me a little bite to eat too? <laughs> but is it, is it about him wanting something from her? No, he's there on a word from the Lord. And, he, and she said, as the Lord my God lives, I don't have a cake. I got a handful of meal in a barrel. I got a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. She said, I, just, I don't have it, man of God. I don't have it. I got a few bites for me and my boy, and that's going to be our last meal. I don't have it. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do what you said, which is what? Make your little cakes. But, are you reading? What did it say? But, make me a little cake first. 
Now, boy, if that would have been today, and some of the major uh, networks had been there. Preacher takes food out of starving child's mouth. And there have been shifty and unscrupulous and immoral preachers that have prophesied money out of people's pocket into theirs. There have been, and there are today. And there were then. But it doesn't change God. It doesn't change truth. It doesn't change what's right. And it doesn't change how God works. He said, bring me a little cake first. Why? Because he was scared he wouldn't get anything to eat? No, no, no. Why? Because this is the key to a blessing, a miracle on their stuff. Oh, come on, come on now. If the first one is blessed, what happens to where it came from? Oh, come on, do you see it now? What happens to where it came from? He said, bring it to me, make me a little cake first and bring it to me and then after that for you and your son for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal will not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail till the day the Lord send rain upon the earth. And she went and did it. Oh, that's why she's in the book. She did it. She did it. Had so little. I mean, from the natural, it looks like she's taking food out of her baby's mouth and had none. One last meal. Oh, but she brought it up there. (laughs) She brought it up there to the man of God. And she did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house, that's her folks. You know, you find new friends and relatives when... When you got food and nobody said, they did eat many days, the margin says a full year. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which is spoken by Elijah. What happened? We just got through reading in Ezekiel, bring the first, the first one to the priest. He may cause the blessing to rest in your house. They brought the first one. The first one that this came from, it came from where? It came from her meal barrel. It came from her oil cruise. That's where that cake came out of. Right? And when she brought that first cake out of that to him, then the miracle power of God rested on that barrel and on that cruise, and it produced and produced and produced for a whole year supernaturally. If the first is blessed, all the rest of what it came from is blessed. Can you say amen? Stand up on your feet.